politics. Hi, Donna. I'm sorry. Hey, I don't know what happened. Totally don't know what happened, but let me just get right back to it, okay? Yeah. Because I think the impeachment managers made their case to the American people. And the fact that they couldn't find 17 senators uh, to go along, what we know after the fact, and Mitch McConnell said it on the Senate floor, is that the impeachment managers made their case, but they chose to hold their um, hat and hang their, hang their verdict on a, a dubious constitutional theory, which had been actually resolved by the institution on the first day of the impeachment. And so they took the sucker's way out and decided not to hold Donald Trump um, accountable. But the fact is, they all know what he did. The American people can see what he did. And, um, and I do worry about our democracy when senators are more worried about their politics than they are about the republic. Yeah, this is what really troubles me. And, and I thought it was stunning that Mitch McConnell made that speech afterwards, basically saying he was convinced on the facts that the president uh, incited an insurrection. But you indicated at the top of the show that you, you feel like we need to do more. What can we do? I know you're uh, brilliant when it comes to, you know, sort of tactics in the United States Senate. Do we need to kill the filibuster? Um, do we need to do something about gerrymandering? What what? do you think needs to happen to, to get the Republican Party to care more about the popular will? Because as you indicated, more than half of the country wanted a conviction. So they just don't care what the people want in this moment. Well, I mean, you know, I, I want to go back to Mitch McConnell for a minute, because I think that he's been given a little bit of, of a pass that I don't plan to give him. And that is this. He very cynically spoke to the American people and on the floor that somehow the um, the wheels of justice would hold Donald Trump accountable in some other uh, forum, which we know is going to be very, very difficult uh, to do, at least on the question of impeachment. They may get him on some other stuff, but on this, this question of the insurrection, mm -hmm. rather, um, I think that's going to be very, uh, very difficult. And McConnell knew that when he made the statement. Not just that, but I think his statement, frankly, was to his donors, his corporate donors, in order to kind of bring them back to the fold. But here is the rub, that you can't on one hand be appeasing your donors and on the other have the base of the party that supports an insurrection. And the vast majority of Republicans in the, um, in the Congress, 139 of them who objected to the electors, I think in Pennsylvania, um, the 40 plus, who uh, decided against uh, that uh, bringing charges against Donald Trump would be unconstitutional. That is a very clear majority of Republicans in the, in the Congress who are not down for democracy. So what can we do, Kim? I think that, look, there are clearly some things around what are the rules of the road going to be in this Congress for getting things done? I think they've got to get rid of the filibuster. I mean, it's been very clear to me in the run-up toward um, delivering the COVID relief package that, again, um, two-thirds or three-quarters of the country actually supports the elements of the COVID relief bill. But you have a, a group of Republicans standing in the way of that. And I think that is going to be true of other things, the minimum wage. Uh, a majority of the American public support raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour, but Republicans uh, and a couple of Democrats are standing in the way. So you know what? Get rid of the filibuster, and all you got to do is get a simple majority. And I think for governance purposes, um, the American people want Joe Biden to be successful for them, um, not for political um, purposes, but for them. And the way to do that is to get rid of the rules, the barriers that are standing in the way. And then on democracy, I think the most important thing that we can do, uh, or one of the most, is really uh, to pass the elements of HR1, a democracy reform bill that really looks at things like money and politics, looks at uh, the structures of democracy, um, and then and pass the you know the new voting rights. Act, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, so that we can make sure that people's votes count no matter what states they're in and no matter, um, no matter their, their race and eth ethnicity. And so we've got to do some serious rule changing in order to make this democracy work. 
And then I think we have responsibilities as individual Americans in our communities. You know, it's not just about voting on election day. It's about all the work that has to happen um, after that and in, in between to hold local elected officials, state elected officials, and of course, members of Congress accountable. Yeah, so, you know, I think people are pretty uh, sort of disheartened, frankly, after impeachment. I mean, Joe Biden won, democracy won, really. Uh, there was this assault on the, the integrity of the electoral system. Then five people die, two suicides, complete assault on the Capitol, and he's acquitted, right? So so we, I agree with what we have to do all these things, but can you crystallize it into just some concrete what regular people could do now? Because we have a lot of students that, that watch this show. If you're, in your, you're a law student or you're a college student, what can they do very concretely to bring democracy back alive, frankly? So Kim, I think that we actually have to reframe this because I would say that yes, the, the president, there weren't enough votes. There wasn't the super majority that was needed to convict the president, but 50 Democrats and seven Republicans, a majority of the Senate thought he was guilty and voted mm -hmm. to convict him. And so I think we have to keep our eyes focused on that because that means that there is a majority in the Senate that actually voted to convict him, even if it couldn't get to the super majority. The other thing to keep in mind is that we have power, um, the power of our voices, the power of our votes, um, things that we can do in our community. And right now, you know, um, on the COVID relief package, we all agree, I think the majority of the American people actually agree that Joe Biden's first order of business is to get a handle, as he says, um, to get a handle on the, on the virus and then to reinvigorate the economy so that all these students out here can actually, you know, graduate, get jobs, um, go to work and contribute to their um, to their communities. And I think raising your voice with your members of Congress on the importance of passing that COVID relief bill is one way to have some control in your hands um, in terms of what you want to do. The other thing that I would say is, and I don't care, you know, I mean, as long as you're like over 18 or, you know, qualified to run, think about yourself as running for elective office or working in government. We need good people working in government. You know, for 30 years, there has been this assault on democracy that's been an assault on the infrastructure of democracy and government, governance, saying that government is bad, that government work is bad, that government can't do anything for you. And you know what? We actually need good people in government to make it work. And we've actually seen during, I mean, we can even see in this latest, like, you know, total disaster down in Texas, what bad governance can bring to you at the state and local level. It can mean that you're without power, you're without water, um, that you're hungry, that you die of hypothermia in your own home. And so uh, having good people in state and local government making decisions about whether you're gonna be on your own grid or be on the national grid is about you surviving. And so I would say to, you know, to young people, uh, the importance of, you know, when you graduate um, school, it used to be when I, I remember when I graduated school, and I won't tell you how long ago it was, but it was a really long time ago. Um, it was like, okay, to fill out your, you know, form and try to figure out whether you were going to work for the federal government. And now, and or for state and local government, now, now people say, oh, wash your hands of that. And I would say, you know what, think about it, because we need smart people, young people, talented people, tech people inside our government to make it work. So pick up your phone and call your representative or email them and, and get involved and give a voice on something you care about. Number two is actually run. Um, but what do you and think- And work, and work. And, and work, work for the federal and government. Work. I'll tell you, it's a noble, noble profession. I did it as well. And these people are very serious about what they do and they really care for the vast majority, care deeply about public service and the rule of law and the constitution and all of those things. Um, but what about the big lie, right? What about this misinformation, um, you know, that that is flowing into our telephones and, you know, 74 million people voted for Donald Trump and substantial parts of the country believe, believe 
that the election was fraudulent. And as you indicated, 126 members of the House of Representatives, Republicans, signed on to a brief in the U.S. Supreme Court trying to steal the votes from four other states. Like, how do we how do we push back on all of those lies, which members of the Republican caucus and, you know, that sounds political, but it's accurate. It's just fact seem to think is their ticket to power. Well, I mean, I think that we have to recognize it for what it is. And, um, you know, as, as consumers of media, I think we've got to be far more discerning about uh, the sources that we use, um, the sources that we refer to our friends and our family members. And when we hear, you know, people are in families and families have a wide range of opinions. And when you hear people in your within your, you know, sort of family group or friends group promote this big lie, don't just let it sit in the ether. Challenge it. Put something else on the table. Because you know what, Kim? I don't believe that we're going to win back all those 74 million people from the, the big lie. I don't think that we're going to win back those 74 million people who, you know, uh, follow a president who, uh, a former president who, like, traffics in racism and xenophobia and homophobia and any other phobia that you can think of. But you know what? Some of them are like, you know, someplace in the middle. So maybe it is that, and I've, I've said this before, and people have, you know, pushed back on me, but I think that, you know, we have a third of the country that is still fighting the Civil War. They haven't given up on the Civil War. Do I believe that I need to spend all of my time trying to, trying to win those people back? Nope. But there's another third that, um, that, you know, for whatever reason, struggles with the information that they're getting and where they're getting it from. And we've got to try to make sure that those people are actually brought, uh, brought into, the, into the fold. And I, I, I guess one of the reasons that I have hope with at least the current president, Kim, is because his, he is like, like a, you know, focused on how is it that we can bring competence to government, we can deliver services, um, that we can you know, focus on what people want and using that as kind of a unifying theme uh, to move forward. So is the Republican Party, though, I mean, the Marjorie Taylor Greene, right, got a standing ovation. Um, Ted Cruz down in, in Texas, while Beto O'Rourke, who, who was his competitor for the Senate, is doing phone banking to help elderly in a crisis of epic proportions in Texas. Um, is this really, is it becoming the party of domestic terrorism, conspiracy theories, and authoritarianism? Is, or is Mitch McConnell going to be able to, to get that back. And then my follow-up question is, um, do you think there's an opening then for that third to come to the Democrats if we are, if the Republican Party is just just headed towards the Lindsey Graham, you know, down in, in Mar-a-Lago, he's still my guy. This, this insurrectionist is still my guy. Yeah, I mean, I think it's actually been deeply troubling that Lindsey Graham, uh, Steve Scalise, the third in line in the in, uh, or second in line in the party, and uh, Kevin McCarthy um, feel like the one way, the one thing that they can do is to go down to mar lago to get the blessing of a twice impeached, um, disgraced president who essentially fomented an insurrection. Um, against the Republic. And, you know, that is the Republican Party. I don't know if it's recoverable, quite frankly. I mean, I think, you know, if you look back in our history, this may be one of these moments where we actually are seeing the dissolution of one party and maybe there will be a recreation of, of another. I don't know. I know it's not my job to recreate the Republican Party. Um, and I don't, and I'm not sure that Mitch, I'm not sure who Mitch McConnell really represents um, in that party, because it seems to me that you still then have this basically two thirds of the party um, in the you right. know, in the House and the Senate who really um, have supported all that's you know all that's gone on, and you know as much by omission um, as well as by admission. And so um, I'm not sure what the future is, and I think that we are going to be living with this. Um, you know, really, um, you know, it's a very right wing um, uh, fascist element of the Republican, the version of the Republican Party for a long time. This is not something that's going to go 
uh, that's going to go away. And um, and I'm not sure, frankly, that it can that the Republican Party, at least that, you know, I've known and gone up against on ideals and ideology um, may be lost. And, you know, there was a time when the Republican Party was viewed as a party that at least had, you know, some kind of governing principles. And right now the governing principle is one that um, was, you know, was um, demonstrated in the insurrection that happened on January 6th. So one of the questions in the chat is, you know, do Democrats need to just not mention, almost like Voldemort, not mention the name. Uh, I've been watching uh, Harry Potter with my kids <laughs> recently. <laughs> um, or, you know, do they need to be a little bit tougher, right? I mean, you know, it's kind of astonishing to me, Donna, to see a little bit how Mitch McConnell seems to still be holding this power over the, the Senate, you know, no witnesses because we'll filibuster everybody behind the scenes when they're in the minority, right? And you kind of say to yourself, wait a minute, if what happened on January 6th was under a Democratic president, I mean, we saw 11 investigations into Benghazi. I can't even imagine the wrath that would come down on the entire Republican Party. Or Ted Cruz, hands off, no one in the, the Democrats are really going after. I mean, what, does the de what do the Democrats need to do to capture the narrative here? And do they need to be a little tougher, a little, a little more, you know, in your face? We're, we're going we're gonna to toe the line. And I think that does come down to the filibuster. Um, that's a pretty, pretty tough move. That right. I mean, yeah. And some believe, okay, that's going to come back to haunt the the Democrats later, as we saw with getting rid of the filibuster for the Supreme Court. We have, you know, or to lower federal courts, and we have three Supreme Court justices that were put on the bench with no Democratic support at all, which is a very scary moment. So, I mean, I, th I think we the Democrats need to do something. What do you think they need to do? Is it just, you know, uh, the president, President Biden, getting a lot done? getting money in people's pockets, getting shots in their arms? You know, is it, what, what do you think, having been in politics for so long? Well, I believe in playing hardball. I like hardball. And I think that, um, I think Dem Democrats, frankly, need to be a little tougher. And this is why, increasingly, I believe that the filibuster has to go. Um, let's, let's look back to where Mitch McConnell was. Even with the, you know, with the change rules, McConnell violated, you know, a, a cardinal rule. He pushed through. He first he stopped Merrick Garland um, from going on as a Supreme Court, a legitimate appointment by uh, Barack Obama that should have been moved forward. Then he bulldozed two other Supreme Court justices through. He had no problem whatsoever doing that. And so you know what, Democrats shouldn't have a problem either. And I hear people who say, well, it'll come back to bite you. And I just say, how many more times can we be bitten? Yeah. Um, and so I'm ready, I'm ready to do that because, you know, even after um, the uh, impeachment trial ended, McConnell's first move was to say, I want to figure out the hook or crook, how we can get the Senate back. Yep. And so I'm going to run candidates myself. And if it means I have to accept some that, uh, come by way of Donald Trump. I'm okay with that as long as I get to the majority. He then put in, um, you know, started playing hardball when negotiating the COVID relief package. And so I don't believe that we should continue to allow him to pretend that he's the majority leader. He's not. He's in the minority, and we need to start acting like we're in the majority. And then in the House, of course, you know, I think that. Um, Nancy Pelosi should be passing the strongest, most progressive bills that she can, and then have those negotiated over to the Senate. So we've got this big uh, stimulus package. Does it have any chance in that giant form of even getting Joe Manchin, even a sort of moderate Democrat? How, how do the wheels of legislation work, Donna? Can you explain that to, to our listeners? Yeah, well, I, I mean, look, I think this is, a, this is a tough one. I think a strong stimulus package comes out of the House um, because it's originating in the House. And this is what people don't understand. All the time that uh, the impeachment trial was going on, the House was over there writing legislation. And so it's going to move its way over into the Senate. I think there is some negotiating room, but I would urge Democrats not to provide all of that room. Republicans have proposed, I think, 600 you know, uh, billion dollars and Democrats are at 1.9 
nine trillion. Maybe there's a pathway with you know a couple of hundred million dollars, but people need what's in that package. This is not just some throwaway. Whether it is the you know the family um, support uh, uh, checks, money that would come directly to folks in the form of a two thousand dollar check, or it's increased um, unemployment during this really difficult time. We actually saw greater unemployment numbers this last month um, than we've seen, and so. Unemployment is setting in, um, and it's you know trying to get people back to work and providing the support that our small businesses need. And so I, I just think we got to get that done. And I and and um, and I don't really see any reason because the American people, as Joe Biden has said, the American people is unified around this, whether Republicans in Congress are unified or not. Right. So just so people understand, normally. Um, it's a 50, it's a majority vote, but a filibuster is an old sort of old fashioned relic where people could basically talk all night to to run out the clock. But now this filibuster functions just, you know, kind of quickly. Right. And or it's, it's a threat or it's, it's a, threat. a threat. It's even a threat. And then and then basically the threshold goes to 60 instead of just 51. But if the Democrats were to go to 51, we, they wouldn't need the Senate support to get all this legislation passed. And we used to have filibusters for federal judges. That's gone. Uh, Harry Reid got rid of it for the lower judges. Mitch McConnell got rid of it for the Supreme Court. And so in my mind, the fact that you can't fire a a federal judge, that's more of a problem to not have a filibuster because legislation, if you don't like it, you can elect a new Congress and they can change it, right? With a a new majority. and I know, I just so viewers understand, you introduced an amendment to the Constitution to get rid of Citizens United. So could you talk a lot, I know we don't have a lot, a lot of time, but electoral reform, what could happen with, if we get rid of the filibuster, we let the Democrats do what the American people want, what are your, t- what, electoral reform, and then knock off the other things that, that's on your wish list? Right. Let me just be really quick, though, because the procedure that Democrats are going to use to move forward the COVID legislation is called reconciliation. And that's why they can't include um, the minimum wage in there, but they can include lots of other things that actually have to do um, with more um, sort of appropriation. So they're going to use that budget reconciliation process. Um, and then, uh, and then, you know, just try to move the legislation forward. I think they'll be able to do that. Um, look, I think we have a number of reforms that need to be made, sort of the democratic structural reforms. The reason that I wanted to get rid of Citizens United is because it, for the first time, the Supreme Court in Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission, and then subsequent legislation basically allowed um, corporations to reach into their pocketbooks and spend on elections. And this has been a disaster. And we can see the, you know, the record spending that goes on in these dark money groups, ads come on television, you don't know who the heck is behind them uh, spending right. money in elections. Uh, so we got to do that because it's a way of giving, you know, giving us control of our elections again. And also, I think um, reforms like how do you run for office and how much money do you have to raise and what sources can you uh, raise it fund and making making sure that we can um, raise money from public funds um, because if we don't own our elections then the other guys do and look at what they're doing to us um, not having electoral uh, uh, campaign finance and money and politics reform really is a disaster for us because it gets in the way of not being able to deal with climate change and um, and getting uh, through you know legislation that that we want because the moneyed interests stand in the way. And then there are these other reforms, of course, having to do with voting rights, which I think are really important. Voting rights are under threat. We already saw after this last election, hundreds of bills are being introduced into state legislatures all across the country, because you know what? Um, The Republican Party, and I'm sad to say, is now not a party of voting rights. Mm -hmm. They're not the party of Lincoln, um, because, you know, what they want to do is, you know, basically keep black and brown people from registering to vote, from showing up to vote, and um, you know, and stopping the mechanisms that allow them uh, those votes to be cast successfully. So that's a big to-do list. 
but I think it's possible because the American people is behind it. Yeah, and it's uh, to your point, it's as old as America, this suppression of black and brown people, keeping them from the ballot box. Three little last questions, predictions. Number one, what's the percentage you think what, that you would predict that, that we'd get rid of the filibuster to get these big legislative reforms through? What do you think? What are you hearing from your friends uh, that are still you know, on the Hill? I, I mean, I actually think there's a strong chance that we will because I think that, um, you know, even uh, Joe Biden has said that he's willing to, you know, work with Republicans and to try to, um, you know, come to agreement with them. But if they stand in the way, he's not going to allow that to get in the way of doing things. And he's a, you know, he's a child of the of the of the Senate. Um, he knows how you move things uh, legislatively. And I think that there's a strong chance that, you know, the more Republicans are obstructionists and stand in the way, the more likely there is uh, uh, the chance that we're going to get rid of the filibuster. That's interesting. He's going to give them a little bit of time to come on board, but, but otherwise he's going to put it down. Question number two, um, not, and I know people don't want to hear about this, but but there is accountability on the table. What are the chances do you think that Donald Trump, you said not so much for the insurrection and indictment that we will see indictments of Donald Trump? Look, we know already that there is civil litigation that's out there that's going to hold him accountable for all of his, you know, I mean, he's had such a range of bad behavior um, that there are any number of things to hang on. Um, and also there is, there is um, possible uh, criminal um, uh, cases that are pending in the Southern District of New York. And there may be an investigation uh, that continues to come out from the Department of Justice regarding what happened on, on January 6th. And we haven't talked about it, but I think it is likely that we are more likely than not that we are going to get a 9-11 style commission, commission that really examines soups to nuts what happened on, on the, in the days and months leading up to January 6th and what has happened since. Because I don't think that this is something that we can just let stand because, you know, we didn't kill the king. We didn't nail the coffin. And that means that there's every opportunity for him to come back and try to do this again. This and was that my question. Is just not acceptable. That was my last question to you, which is what are the chances of another insurrection? Because it seems like if you get away with it, there's no pushback. Why not try it again and do, do it better time, num you know, second time around? Well, obviously, we have to be very, um, very vigilant. Um, but the one thing that we can do is we can, you know, I mean, the Republican Party doesn't have to continue to like prop up this guy. Um, but right now he's the spokesperson, he's the chief guy, he's the you know number one cheese for the Republican party, the party of um, you know of chaos. And you know they, they have decisions to make on their own about who they want to lead their, their party. And the rest of us are gonna have to be vigilant and we're gonna have to put levers in place and say, you know, we're not gonna tolerate this more. Look. Last thing, I would love to have a piece of legislation passed that would require all candidates uh, for federal office uh, to release their tax returns before they can appear on a ballot in the states to run for uh, to run for office, including the president of the United States. That might stop him right there. That, that's an excellent point. I, I know I said the last question, but I <laughs> have a number of things in the chat here. The question is, can Joe Biden whip the Senate to get rid of the filibuster. And would that knock out Manchin? But it sounds like there is at least three senators on the Democratic side that don't have an appetite for that. Because that's really the heart of what we're talking about. There's so much that can be done to implement the will of the American people, gun legislation, climate change, immigration reform, health care reform, uh, COVID relief, uh, um, minimum wage, all of these things people want. But we can't do it if you've got uh, you know, the obstructionists in the Senate hanging on uh, with this filibuster option. Yeah, this is why I think it's really important that um, Biden, you know, take this very strategically, um, try to pass that COVID relief bill and negotiate it, try whatever that, you know, sort of next legislative uh, priority is to try to get Republicans on board. But if they continue, if they stand in the way, we cannot allow, and I think Joe Biden will really not allow them to neuter his presidency like that. And I think that that would then become a much more compelling argument to the mansions of the world. Fascinating. Well, Donna Edwards, thank you so much for your time. It's been a tremendous, tremendous privilege to have you on and uh, have a great night. Thank you again.
Thank you. Good to see you. This is Simple Politics with Kim Whaley. Thank you, everyone, for joining, uh, and have a, a terrific uh, rest of the weekend.